friends! Welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video, I'm going to be doing the mid-year book freakout tag. This is something I do most years. I don't know if I've done it every year since I started, but most years. And it's something that comes around halfway point. We like to look at all the books we've read so far, freak out about how many books we still have to read when we're already halfway through the year. It's always fun. So we're going to go ahead and dive into this. I have links to the original creators of the tag down below if you're interested and the questions if you want to do it yourself. So let's go ahead and dive right into the mid-year book freakout tag. Fair warning, and this is not new, but I read a lot of books, so I'm gonna have multiple answers for most of these questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> like you're supposed to pick one, but I did not pick one for most of these. Okay, so question number one, best book you've read so far in 2023. And when I was looking at my list of favorite books, there were two that stood out. So I'm going to tell you about both of them. And what I think is interesting is that this year, both of my favorites so far are horror. One is adult, one is YA. For YA, that book is Delicious Monsters by Lizelle Sambury. And listen, like I am kind of friends, acquaintances with Lizelle. We've met and we follow each other. I try to give that disclaimer, but genuinely this book was just everything I didn't know that I wanted. The nuanced character work is so smart. The way that she does these really horrific scenes while weaving in deep themes. I was just really blown away by this. I would say this reads as upper YA. It's pretty intense for younger teenagers, but I loved it. I'm so excited to see more horror coming from Lizelle because I think she's fantastic at it. Uh, if you haven't tried her, highly recommend. This book's amazing. My other favorite book is Lone Women by Victor Lavelle. This took me by surprise in some ways. It sounded interesting, but I don't think I expected to love it as much as I did. This one was also one I actually buddy read, which I think made it an even better experience. I read this with Mara from Books Like Woe, Angela from Literature Science Alliance, and our friend Jocelyn, and it's so good. There's so many layers to this. It is one that I think is great for discussion, but hard to talk about because spoilers. You don't want to spoil anything. You kind of should go in not knowing too, too much. But this is historical. It's set in the early 1900s and it follows a young black woman who is leaving her parents who have been brutally killed with a strange trunk in her possession that weird things happen and people disappear every time she opens the trunk. And she is going off to the wilds of Montana to pioneer and start a new life for herself. And then there end up being other characters that join in later on. The, this book, again, amazing character work, great themes, truly creepy moments in the story. I think even though the plots are quite different, in terms of why I love them so much, these two books have a lot in common. They're amazing. Question two, what is the best sequel you've read so far in 2023? And I've got a couple of answers for this. One is not really a sequel, it's more of a companion novel. This did make me realize I haven't read a lot of sequels this year that I've loved, but I have read some good ones. The two best of what I have read are The Tea Dragon Tapestry by K. O'Neill. I think this is my favorite of the series. I love these so much. They're adorable graphic novels with these little dragons that grow tea on the top of their heads and they're diverse and inclusive and just really, really lovely. This one kind of made me tear up because the story is really about grieving the person you used to be and learning to embrace who you are now and where you're going. Oh, my ghostly ring light is making an appearance. Hasn't done that in a while. We must be getting towards summer. <laughs> I found it happens when it's when it's like in too much heat. So yeah, this was amazing. I loved it. The other sequel I loved was Warrior Girl Unearthed by Angeline Bully. This was amazing. It is technically a companion novel. It's set 10 years after the events of Firekeeper's Daughter, and a character who had been a kid at that point is now 16 years old. And I just really, really love Angeline Bully's work. I think it's amazing. And it's this blend of a 
kind of thriller mystery heist plot a little bit with a coming of age story and a lot of information that I learned things I didn't know about the reclamation of cultural artifacts and ancestral remains for indigenous people, the laws surrounding that, how difficult it is to get those things back and some of some of the issues with that. So this was just an incredible second book. I loved it. I love the main character in it. It was really fun also to see Donis, the character from the first book, as an adult be kind of starting her own life. That was fun. Yeah, this was excellent. Question three, a new release that you haven't read yet, but want to. For this question, I decided to go ahead and look at all the books that I've pre-ordered this year. I've got to say I'm doing pretty good at getting to my pre-orders. I've been reading the majority of them, although there are some that I haven't read yet. So I want to tell you about three books that I was excited enough about to pre-order and really do want to read this year, but haven't read yet. First is Don't Fear the Reaper by Stephen Graham Jones. I'm kind of saving this for October. I feel like that's going to be when I want to pick this up. It's the sequel to My Heart is a Chainsaw, which was one of my favorite horror novels the year it came out. And this one is the follow-up set several years later. So I expect to really like this. I do want to read it, but again, I'm kind of saving it for probably the fall. Then one that I I think I might read really soon. I keep wanting to pick it up and I think this might happen really soon, but The Blood Gift by Annie Davenport. Another book that is a follow-up to one of my favorite books the year that it came out. I absolutely loved The Blood Trials and this is just a duology, so I really want to finish up the story and read the sequel. And then lastly is Mortal Follies by Alexis Hall. This actually just came out, so it hasn't even been in my possession for long, but it is a historical fantasy romance, a queer historical fantasy romance that sounds like everything I need. A young noble woman must pair up with an alleged witch to ward off a curse in this irresistible sapphic romance. Yes. Also, I love Alexis Hall's writing, so I'm very excited for this. Question four. What is your most anticipated release for the second half of the year? Um, okay, so there's always a lot of books I'm excited about, but I picked out three to talk about. The first one, I enjoy books from this author, but I'm just so curious how her first adult release in a different world is gonna go. And I'm even more intrigued. Okay, okay, let me explain. So Swordcatcher by Cassandra Clare is coming out this fall, right? And it's the first book that she's written for adults that is not in the Shadowhunter world at all. She's been talking about this book for years, right? Like I was at an event years ago where she mentioned how this was coming and it kept getting pushed back and back and back. And I've been curious about it for years. So it finally is coming out and it was blurbed by George R. R. Martin, and they're doing an event together, which is like not the pairing I would expect, right? I, I just, this is one that I'm just really curious about. So let me read you because I, I saved this on Instagram. I was like, what? This is what George R. R. Martin had to say about Swordcatcher. Swordcatcher gave me everything I look for in fantasy, mystery and magic, not too much, not too little, expert world building, sword play and politics, a colorful cast of interesting characters, and a story that kept me reading from the first page to the last with enough twists and turns to keep me turning the pages. It's a big thick book, but it left me wanting more. When's the next one coming out? And they're doing an event together. That is really interesting. So I'm I'm excited to try that and see how it goes. If people are interested, maybe I'll do a reading vlog for it. I, you know, I might do that. Anyway, another one that I'm really excited about is The Reformatory by Tanana Reeve Du. Apparently this is the first full-length novel that she's written in a while, and the premise of this sounds like it's going to be really good. It is one that I have pre-ordered. It says it's a gripping page turning novel set in Jim Crow, Florida, following Robert Stevens Jr. as he's sent to a segregated reform school that is a chamber of terrors where he sees the horrors of racism and injustice for the living and the dead. So it's it's a horror novel at a reform school. I I think 
this is going to be great. It's also really long, it's almost 600 pages. I am so curious about this. Lastly is The Ruined by Renee Audier. This is the fourth and final book in the beautiful series, which I've really been loving. This was supposed to come out last year and got delayed, so it's finally supposed to be coming out this December, and I am very excited to finally read the conclusion to the series and see what happens. So those are three of my most anticipated books for the rest of the year. <sighs> Question five, what was your biggest disappointment? I have a few for this. <laughs> I have two books that were big disappointments that I actually read to completion and two books that I DNF'd that I really thought I was gonna love. In terms of books that I finished, the first one is The Witch and the Vampire by Francesca Flores. I was so excited for this. A sapphic Rapunzel retelling. Yeah, that sounds great. And the cover was really beautiful. This was just not very good. <laughs> what did I say about it? This was like, I, I had such high hopes for this. And I had, I to, to be fair, I had forgotten that I'd read the debut novel from this author and also didn't get on with it. So I should have probably put that together. But people can also you know, have a book that you don't like and then another one that you do. It's been a while since I read this one, so I'm gonna look at my Goodreads review. <laughs> right, yeah, I so I gave this one one and a half stars. Oh yeah, so for first of all, calling it a Rapunzel retelling is a real stretch. It's barely a Rapunzel retelling, so I, I don't know about that marketing. So I said the marketing misrepresents what this is, but also I kind of get why they tried to find an angle to pitch it that sounded interesting because the actual story is dull and info dumpy with characters who feel very one note and so much telling rather than showing. Plus, a lot of character choices don't make much sense. The villains are just villainous rather than nuanced and without a good reason. We're told there is meaningful history between our two heroines, but we never really actually see it. For instance, there's this scarf that randomly shows up two thirds of the way through the book in Ava's bag that we're told has meaning for their relationship, but none of the setup for that had ever been done. It was just kind of thrown in there. There was a lot of things like that in this book. It just, it was not very good and that was unfortunate. My other big disappointment that I completed was Witch King by Martha Wells. I just thought it was convoluted and kind of dull. I, I did not get on well with that book and I was bummed because I've really loved other things that I've read from her but yeah that one just did not really work for me. Then I have two books that I had advanced copies of that I was very excited about and I ended up DNFing them. So the first one was A Crown of Glass and Ivy by Claire Legrand, which I'm still really sad about because she's written a couple of my all-time favorite books and the la like this is the second book in a row I've struggled with from her. I don't know, go check out my Goodreads review. This is gonna get too long, so check out my Goodreads review if you wanna hear details, but I was really excited. It's supposed to be a fantasy romance retelling of a ballet of some sort. It wasn't great, to be honest. I kind of think it might have to do with what Sourcebooks Fire is leaning into. It just didn't work for me, like, anyway check out my Goodreads review. It's always Goodreads is linked down below if you want to hear more. And lastly was The Archive Undying. Just because I love the cover, let's be real, the premise sounded amazing, the cover is one of my favorite covers, and it was just, it was very vague and convoluted and hard to follow and unclear. I think the author had a really clear vision in their head of what they were trying to do, but as a reader it was very frustrating. <laughs> Question six, what was your biggest surprise? I've picked three for this prompt as well. Two of them are on my favorites list and one isn't, but it's pretty high up there. The first one's a surprise because I picked it up on a whim to fill a prompt for the Trans Rights Readathon. It had been sitting on my shelf for years and I thought I would like it, but I ended up really, really loving it. And that's the Mary Spinster Tales of Everyday Horror by Daniel M. Lavery. This was so good. I was not expecting it to hit the way that it did for me. I do think part of it is because where I'm at in my own personal sort of religious deconstruction journey, the way that this read to me in terms of talking about religion and queerness and various things, but I really, really loved this a lot. It was great. And then the other one that was a big surprise, my patrons made me read this, and I don't know that I ever would have picked it up, and it was so good, was The Girl Who Drank the Moon by Kelly Barnhill. 
I love this. One of the best middle grade books that I've read. It's so beautiful. The writing is really lovely and nuanced and it made me kind of tear up. I just I really love this a lot. So these two were definitely surprises that made my favorites list. And then most recently, and maybe I shouldn't be surprised, I picked up a copy of this because I kept hearing people talk about it. I'm not usually a big historical fiction reader, especially YA historical fiction. However, I made an exception because it was queer YA historical fiction and everybody was talking about how amazing it was and they were right. They were right. Last Night at the Telegraph Club by Melinda Lowe. It's so good. It is a queer coming of age story following a Chinese American girl living in San Francisco in the 1950s during the Red Scare. And it, like, it's excellent. Really excellent. The way that it seamlessly weaves in the historical information into this narrative that's very compelling. I cared so much about this and did not expect to. So that was a surprise as well. Question seven is favorite new author. This can be debut or new to you. And the first one is somebody that I have read before. I read a couple of their books last year, but I think this year really cemented them as an author that I'm gonna read whatever they decide to put out and really just love the way that they tell stories. And that's C.L. Polk. I did a reread this year, if even though I knew the end, and I read Midnight Bargain, which is their historical fantasy of romance of manners, I guess you would call it. But except that it's actually not about that, it's actually about bodily autonomy. <laughs> like, it's it's so good. I really, really love the way that they tell stories, the way they write characters, their writing really works for me. And I, I would say that they're a new favorite. And then for the biggest surprise that I never in a million years would have guessed. And, and to be fair, I have still not read this person's books that he's most notoriously known for. However, I have now read two horror stories from Chuck Tingle, the man himself, and I loved them. Straight is a novella. It was fantastic. Camp Damascus, which is a novel about to come out, was even better. One of my favorite things that I've read this year, and I've made videos talking about it, I love these. And I think we can safely say Chuck Tingle is probably an ex-evangelical because Camp Damascus has some real deep cuts in like evangelical culture. Man. Um, yeah, Chuck Tingle. And the just for reference, here is the weird gay erotica that he was previously known for. We don't really even know who he is. He's an anonymous author. But I absolutely love his horror and this makes me curious to try some of his backlist titles even though I know they're going to be really different. But yeah, who knew? Chuck Tingle everybody. I hope he writes more because I will read it. Question eight is newest fictional crush. This is always kind of a weird question but we're gonna go with this is a couple of my favorite love interests from romances. That, that's that's what we're going with. So I've got two. The first one is a character named PG from If You'll Have Me by Uni. This doesn't come out till this fall, y'all, but I like the way this is my Joker. <laughs> I am so obsessed with this graphic novel. It is the freaking cutest sapphic romance, college sapphic romance ever. I am obsessed. So PG is the hot Asian love interest who's going around seducing all the ladies. And then the other main character is this kind of quiet, nerdy, bookish, anxious girl and they fall in love. And it's like the most adorable thing you've ever seen. So go pre-order it. I'm probably going to keep talking about it and find a way to like wiggle myself into the promotions for it if the publisher will let me. But yeah, this was so good. The other one is Joss from The Secret Lives of Country Gentlemen by K.J. Charles. This was just the most fun historical rom-com, queer historical rom-com, and I, I just loved it. I loved the relationship between the two main characters, and Joss is just so fun because he's the head of this smuggling family, and you know, but you know, he's he's also got family issues that he's trying to work through. I just, 
this was this was great. It made me think I need to read more from KJ Charles. Question nine, newest favorite character. I think for this I'm gonna go with Keen from Sister Song by Lucy Holland. This was another one of my favorite books I read this year that was I guess unexpected. I mean this also could have been a surprise now that I think about it but I absolutely loved this. Apparently it's a retelling of an old folk song or tale or, or something. I don't I don't really know but it's set in like far, far back the UK following three siblings and there's magic, there's fantasy elements to it. Keen is one of the siblings and is trans. I just loved his story so much. It made me cry. And um, I loved his character arc and the way that this put all of that together in a way that was like contextually made sense for the his historical time period. But the whole, the whole book was great. I, yeah. Highly recommend if you haven't read it. Speaking of which, <laughs> the next question is, what's a book that made you cry? Well, Sister Song definitely made me cry. The the sort of ending of Keen's story had me in tears. I loved it. This was caught on camera for posterity for patrons and channel members because they made me read this. It's another case of them making me read something I ended up really loving. And then The Lesbiana's Guide to Catholic School by Sonora Reyes. This also made me cry. Sobbing. Sobbing at the ending. This is also on camera. Everybody can see it. It's in the like patrons pick my TBR video if you want to watch. But I loved this so much. It's a queer YA coming of age story that just so beautifully captures how it can still be dangerous for some queer teenagers to come out while they're still living under their parents' roof and how there are concerns with that. I just, I love this a lot. So yeah, both of these made me cry. And I don't cry in a lot of books. There's usually a couple to a handful every year that make me cry. And these are two. And both of them, both of them made my favorites list, if that tells you anything. Whew, we're getting there. All right. Question 11 is a book that made you happy. Uh, okay. So the first one that came to mind, I feel like maybe, honestly, I keep thinking about it. I probably should bump it up to a six star, which is favorite of the year status and buy myself a copy. But The Fiance Farce by Alexandra Belfleur, one of my favorite romances that I've read this year. Oh my god, I love it so much. It's this contemporary sapphic romance that's just everything that I wanted it to be. The premise is great. It follows this girl who's kind of a nerdy bookseller who, to get her family off her back, has made up a fake girlfriend and given her the name of one of her favorite romance cover models. So she's at her cousin's wedding and who should show up at the wedding but that cover model? And so she's like, oh god, no, my life is over. But the cover model just goes along with it because as it turns out, she actually needs to get married to get her inheritance. So there's like a modern marriage of convenience thing happening. I, I loved this. It made me so happy. It was great. Another one that was just the most fun popcorn read, one of the most fun reading experiences I've had. And I know people are vastly split about this. I've made a video about it. I know some people hate it. Some people love it. But this made me happy is Fourth Wing by Rebecca Yaros. I, I, I hear the criticism and most of them are, you know, maybe not wrong. I just wasn't bothered by most of them. I loved this. It was so much fun. It was like, I have been desperately wanting a book that would deliver these tropes. And this gave me exactly what I was looking for. It's a magic school, but college age, and there's dragons. I mean, what's not to like? <laughs> I say that, but a lot of people really hated this book. But a lot of people also loved it. So I'm not like I'm in reasonably good company. But this book made me happy. So one of my favorite books just because it was one of the most enjoyable reading experiences I've had this year. The other two books that came to mind for this are both what I would call more cozy fantasy and one of them I didn't expect to be as cozy as it was. That is The Warden by Daniel M. Ford. This was pitched as Twin Peaks but with wizards, which I was like immediately yes. And yeah, kind of, I see where they're going with it. But also I would say where Twin Peaks leans into weird horror, this leans more into coziness, but it has a bisexual female necromancer wizard who is the warden for this out of the way small village and has to deal with stuff. And it has a lot of slice of life moments, but also more plot than some of the cozier fantasies you'll read. So I loved this. Similarly, 
Tress of the Emerald Sea by Brandon Sanderson. I didn't expect to enjoy as much as I did. This is one I could see myself rereading, reading to my kids in a year or two maybe. It feels like something that could be a classic. It's got that kind of classic adventure feel plus cozy fantasy. I had to change the battery so I'm not sure if this looks a little different but if it does that's why. Anyway I think I was talking about Tress of the Emerald Sea but yeah this was just really fun and enjoyable and I didn't know how much I would like it. Question 12. What is the most beautiful book you've bought so far this year or received? And I mean, topping that list, honestly, Tress of the Emerald Sea. I am so glad that I did the Kickstarter for the books because they're so beautiful. Like this edition is just stunning. It's got beautiful end papers and there is artwork throughout the book that is so pretty. As an example, yeah, this this is definitely the most beautiful book that I've gotten this year. But there are a couple others I want to highlight and actually both of these are the UK editions of these books. Well one of them I guess is a special edition. Anyway, but uh, we have the paperback UK edition of The Luminaries by Susan Dennard. I loved this book. I have the US hardcover. I love. She's one of my favorite authors and this was just really fun YA fantasy I'll and like look at the edge. It's so pretty. I just think this is one of the most beautiful books that I've gotten this year. And then the other one is the Waterstones edition of The Adventures of Amina El Sarafi by Shannon Shocker Bordy and it's signed like look at the gilding. Oh my gosh, it's so pretty. It's got red sprayed edges and it's got a map. Like that map is gorgeous. I just like, can you even? Yeah. So those are definitely the most beautiful books that I've gotten this year. Lastly, we're almost done. Question 13. What books do you need to read by the end of the year? Now, of course, I have lots of books for review that I need to read by the end of the year. But for this question, I decided to go with the rest of the books on my challenge TBRs. Every year I like to set different genre challenge TBRs for myself of things to get through by the end of the year. I'm actually doing pretty well with this. I think there were 23 books on the original TBR and I have eight left to read. So I'm doing well. And I've got plans for reading at least a couple of them. So here are the challenge books that I still need to read by the end of the year. Three of them are on my classics TBR. First up we have The Lottery by Shirley Jackson. This is a short story. It's in this like beautiful little cloth bound edition and it shouldn't take long to read but I want to read more Shirley Jackson and I think she's well known for the story. I just don't think I've read it. I might be wrong. Maybe I have but I don't recall. And then another one of these adorable little editions is Hellscreen by Ryunosuke Akutagawa. This is classic Japanese horror in translation and it's short stories. So that I'm excited to read. And then the last one from my classics TBR is The Magic Toy Shop by Angela Carter, which is kind of a creepy novel that we're actually reading for Blades and Bodice Rippers book club in October, so I already have a plan for getting this read. Then on my nonfiction TBR, I have two books left to read. Women, Race, and Class by Angela Davis. I've been wanting to read from her and I haven't yet. And Killing Rage, Ending Racism by Bell Hooks, another author I've been wanting to read. So two nonfiction books. And then lastly, I've got three fantasy books on my challenge TBR. The first one is Fool's Errand by Robin Hobb. This is the first book in the Tawny Man trilogy and I have plans for reading this. I'm going to be doing a read along this fall of the trilogy with some friends. I also have The Shadowed Sun by N.K. Jemisin, the second book in the Dreamblood duology because I want to finish reading all of Jemisin's backlist. I've gotten some requests for a video similar to the one I did on Sylvia Moreno Garcia about where to start with Jemisin and kind of information on all the books she's written but I need to read a few more books from her before I can do that so this is one of them. And then lastly, we have Moon Witch Spider King by Marlon James. I put this on the TBR because I want to read it, but I know it's going to be a beast to get through. And so I thought putting it on a challenge TBR might be a good way to go. So those are the challenge books I have left to read in 2023. 
Uh, but so far it's been a really great year. As of the filming of this video, I have read 215 books so far, which is great and pretty on track for my normal number. The last few years have ended up reading around 400, but my reading typically dips a little bit in the summer months because kids are home from school and there's just a lot going on. So uh, really happy with how it's been going. I've read some amazing things and I would love to hear from you in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts on anything I shared in this video. And for a question of the day, just pick one of the questions in the tag and answer it down below if you want to share a book that meets any of these criteria. Let me know. If you like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.